Well, welcome back to CSI Coatesville. In this segment, we're going to examine fiber evidence. Please stay with us. Now, you decide serial killer or scapegoat. When we look at 1979 to 1981, Atlanta saw for the first time a, uh, in a major city in America, the first African-American mayor. And also during that time, disturbingly, 28 African-American youths, mostly males, were found dead in or near the Chattahoochee Rover. And as you can imagine, pressure is going to amount uh, on the police and the mayor as the body count rises. During this time, a stakeout at a bridge spots Wayne Williams acting oddly near the bridge, and later Williams is formally charged and convicted with two of these slangs. And at the center of the case were these unusually shaped olive green fibers from carpet, presumably. Is there sufficient evidence here to convict this gentleman of these two murders? And in fact, all 28 murders were closed as a result of this conviction. Is this evidence really sufficient? Was he, in fact, the serial killer that's responsible for all 28 of these murders? Or was he just a convenient scapegoat? You decide. And as we go into this program, we're going to examine uh, sources of fibers. We're also going to examine the structure of fiber evidence as well. And we're going to learn to distinguish fibers uh, in the laboratory. And then finally, and most importantly with this case, we're going to judge the probative value of fiber evidence in general and apply that to the case that we have with Wayne Williams. So, let's take a look at this. What is fiber evidence? Take a look at this photograph. Fibers are any type of natural or man-made filaments of a textile, be that cloth or woven material. And uh, when we use the term filament in this context, we're referring to those single strands that you can see in this photograph that are twisted together to produce thread or fiber. So filaments are often transferred from clothing, uh, from rope, from furniture, or carpet, as we saw in the Wayne Williams case. So what are some of the sources of fiber? Well, there are many natural sources of fiber, cotton, wool, cashmere, silk, and, uh, and wool as well, and mohair. Uh, there are also synthetic fibers as well. Nylon, rayon, acrylic, polyester, and acetate. They are either synthetic and others they are produced by petroleum products or they're some other sort of fiber that's modified uh, chemically uh, to produce a different product. There's also mineral fibers as well, asbestos, rock wool, and fiberglass um, that are also fall under this category of fiber. And natural fibers, as you can see, they're going to be either carbohydrate or they're going to be similar to what we find in human hair. They're going to be made out of protein. Uh, and so chemically, they're going to be distinguished from, from these other two categories. Now, when we look at the structure of fabrics, you're going to hear these terms, warp and weft. What do we mean by them? Well, as the fabric comes off a loom, um, the, the lengthwise yarn of the fabric, uh, what you see going from top to bottom, uh, is the warp. These are usually stronger than those that are going to, back, that are going to go back and forth. They're stronger and they're smaller. Uh, and then the weft is the crosswise yarn that you can see. Now the warp and the weft of a fabric, they can be made of the same uh, type of fiber, the same source, or they can be mixed, they can be blended, uh, made of a different source. For example, the t-shirt that you may be wearing right now may be a blend of cotton and polyester, which is quite common. In fact, the, the shirt that I'm wearing uh, in this program uh, is a blend of polyester and cotton. And, and if you're ever curious about that, all you need to do is take whatever shirt you're wearing and turn up the left hip and you'll see a tag there uh, at the seam that will identify the sources of fiber that garment is made from. And of course, different tags are placed in different locations, uh, varying types of garments. 
All right, and there are also a variety of different weaves. The one that you see pictured here is actually known as a common weave, but there's also satin and there's also a twill, which we'll, I'll show you a picture of uh, in a moment. So warp and weft are the two key terms where, when we're referencing the structure of a fabric. And then keep in mind, there's also knitted garments as well. If you're wearing uh, athletic gear, for example, right now, many of those are, are knitted. Uh, when you look at them closely, they're not going to fit into any of these three weave patterns that we see pictured here. And they can come in, in a variety of structures. So, of these three, satin, common, or twill, the one that you're looking at here in this photograph is common, where you can see an alternating pattern of both the warp and the weft, which is distinct from satin, where you can see fewer of the, uh, of the weft, the crosswise yarns are included, which gives this a very smooth, what they refer to as a smooth hand, as you brush your hand across that type of fabric. And, and then finally, the, the twill is kind of a staircase pattern that you see here. And the most common uh, place that you see twills would be in blue jeans, believe it or not, when you look at those closely. Now let's take a look at polymers because uh, many fabrics that you see are of one variety of, of polymer or not. So it's appropriate to use this term. And polymers, as you know, the, the prefix poly means many, mer is the actual individual molecule of which these, um, these chemicals are made. They're made up of these long chains of repeating smaller units referred to as monomers. And, and in fact, the vast majority of textiles are made of one sort of polymer or another, be they natural or synthetic. And so we're really looking at, in many cases, some type of a plastic that's um, made out of petroleum in one form. And when we look at these, we want to understand how they're manufactured very briefly as well. Here we have a heated barrel uh, in this diagram. And the pellets that we saw in the previous photograph are dumped into this hopper. And as these pellets are pushed through uh, this barrel, uh, in this heated barrel, they're going to be forced across the baker plate and then through a metal die that, as you can see, is going to have a very fine diameter uh, in the end. And so these are forced through under pressure. Uh, and that's going to produce the many varieties of, of yarn uh, that you see pictured here. Many of these have the pigment the, uh, blended in to that plastic while it's in the molten state. Uh, other ones are, are vat dyed where they would take the, the yarns and they would immerse them uh, into a dye. So the dye doesn't go all the way through the fiber but merely clings to the outside. That's very common with cotton uh, types of filament where you don't have the color all the way through, but it's just merely coated on the outside. And that's why cotton fibers, for example, and, you know, if I had this shirt that I'm wearing and I spill bleach on this, well, that's going to leave a permanent mark because the, the color from that dye is only on the surface uh, where it's going to be degraded by the chlorine bleach or any other type of chemical like that. All right, and understand that as these polymers are extruded through that very fine dye, it's very similar to how spiders make spider webs. You have these um, protrusions coming out of the abdomen of the spider uh, that are going to produce that um, spider's web. And so these are produced in a very similar way. Now, under the microscope, we can compare uh, and we're looking at a, an electron micrograph here where you can see the structure of different types of fibers are really quite unique. The coarse wool that you see here is typical to sheep that are raised here in America. Australian wool and New Zealand wool, for example, the hair is much finer uh, on the breeds of um, sheep that you see raised there. And, and so they're relatively easy to distinguish. The diameter of the hair is, is much more fine. Uh, in New Zealand wool. Alpaca, you can see, has a, an imbricate pattern on the outside. However, the individual scales that are on the, um, on the cuticle of these hairs is actually much finer. Uh, that's also true of cashmere. Um, and, and then you can see silk here is very narrow diameter. It's got a very smooth finish on the outside that comes, of course, from silkworms. Uh, linen is um, a fiber, a very natural um, carbohydrate fiber that comes from flax plants. Uh, and that's been used for several millennia in 
and making garments. Uh, the cotton that we have here in America, you can see that is a, it's almost like a flat ribbon that gets twisted uh, under the microscope. So these are very easy to recognize when you're examining uh, a garment uh, under the microscope. And then the, the, one of the most common kinds of filaments that we see is the polyester over here on the right. Very smooth, very uniform, of course. This being a synthetic filament uh, is going to be extruded through that machine that I previously showed to you. So keep all of these in mind. The cotton is flattened and twisted in appearance. The wool is similar to human hair, but maybe finer. The silk is very fine and smooth. Now, how can we distinguish these in the laboratory? One of the most common and easy tests that we can do, referred to as the burn test. Cotton and linen, when these kinds of garments are burned because they're carbohydrates, they're going to smell very similar to burning paper or leaves. Some of my students have even commented that it smells like marshmallows being toasted. Of course, that's also a carbohydrate. And they're typically going to leave uh, a white smoke uh, and a white ash as well. When we perform the burn test to wool, however, it's going to be similar to burning hair. So it's going to be a very acrid, very displeasing uh, kind of odor. If you've ever burned your hair by mistake, you would certainly recognize that. They typically leave a black ash. Uh, so it's one way to broadly break these kinds of filaments down into different categories. Silk is going to be similar to wool uh, because it's going to be proteinaceous coming from an animal. The synthetics, however, are going to have an altogether different smell. It's going to smell more like burning plastic or maybe even some kind of an oily smell, something like diesel fuel being burned. And that, again, is going to leave a black ash. As you burn it, um, it, would be it would be common for you to see these kinds of filaments uh, actually melt as they burn. And so they would drip onto the surface uh, underneath. Uh, so these are relatively easy to spot when you perform the burn test. But that's not all. There's other types of tests that we can apply. For example, many fibers are going to reflect uh, different wavelengths of light in a rather unique way. So fluorescence is a very important test. So if you were to take these fabrics and put them under an ultraviolet light, for example, uh, cotton is going to light right up, as well as many of these synthetics. Also, chemical tests can be used. Does this particular filament, does it dissolve in an acid or in a base? Does it dissolve in a solvent such as acetone? Um, how is it going to decompose when it's exposed to different types of harsh chemicals? Those can also be indicators as to the type a variety of the filament. They're very useful. And uh, not uh, unimportant are the dye molecules themselves with which the, the filaments are made. Uh, and we can use different types of chromatography in order to tease out the different molecules that are used uh, in the dyeing process. So chromatography can be very useful. Uh, in identifying specific molecules that are used in the dye. And again, all we're doing is we're dividing the varieties of different types of fiber uh, into smaller and smaller categories to narrow down exactly where that type of fiber was produced. Uh, now, when we get into the courtroom, the, uh, the commonality of the different types of fiber groups that you see pictured here is going to be an indication of their probative value, as I see here. And very briefly, the probative value of fiber evidence is inversely proportional uh, to the quantity it's produced. So if we have a very large quantity, such as polyester or cotton in the chart that you see here, they're going to be of less probative value, less helpful in determining the source of where that filament, that fiber came from uh, at the crime scene. Those sections of this pie, which, is our, which are relatively small, or blends, fabric that's made of very unusual blends of fabric, they're going to have a higher probative value, understandably. Okay. Now, when we go back to the courtroom, one of the realities that makes 
processing and interpreting fiber evidence so difficult to understand uh, is the fact that you can have transfer from the from more than one source so you could have a transfer that could go you know onto a third object that may not really be related to the events that you're trying to reconstruct here there is a variety of secondary transfers um, that seem to be evident in the O.J. Simpson murder trial, which tended to conflate uh, interpreting that kind of evidence. So secondary transfer uh, tends to undermine the confidence of statistics when it's presented by prosecutors in the courtroom. And any defense attorney is going to certainly capitalize on that, especially if this is an important aspect of the case being tried. Okay, so what do I mean by a secondary transfer? That, that you don't ha necessarily have a direct transfer from the, uh, from the perpetrator of a crime to the crime scene itself, or from the perpetrator to the victim, or vice versa. That some third object uh, could be involved in some way. And again, because that can occur, and, and it may come from different sources there that's going to complicate the interpretation of this type of evidence. And so we're back where we started. Was Wayne Williams a serial killer in fact, or was he just a convenient scapegoat? As you can see, he was convicted and is currently serving two life sentences in the Georgian prison, prison system. And appeals to the Georgia Supreme Court have failed to overturn his request for a new trial. Pivotal in his connection are these very unusual green carpet fibers linking the victims to the Williams residence. And yet, questions still remain. While this type of carpet, carpet was recovered uh, from one of the victims, it's still not uh, a slam dunk um, relationship that these olive green fibers actually came from the carpet in Wayne Williams' residence. It was discovered later on after the trial that these kinds of filaments are also used in office carpet. Well, where does that leave us? So we don't really see a direct connection. And because this was a significant part um, of the case that the prosecution built, questions still remain. Um, those that have written books on this case uh, a number of them have come down to decide, based upon circumstantial evidence, that Williams was responsible for some of these 28 murders. Um, but all 28 of those cases were closed by the Atlanta Police Department. And again, so questions still remain as to whether or not Wayne Williams was guilty in fact of committing all 28 murders. And so that's what makes this type of evidence such a challenge. Uh, to interpret because we're dealing with class evidence. You know, it's not as though uh, you can quickly ascertain DNA from a polyester fiber. It's not going to be there. It's not going to be there from the fiber. And even if you did, that fiber itself, the polyesters, are, are very commonly used you know, throughout the textile industry. So you really haven't narrowed down the probability uh, of this source of fiber uh, the way you might have otherwise, such as uh, in hair evidence where you have DNA that's available. All right, well, listen, thanks for watching and uh, give me a like underneath this video if you found it to be helpful. Bye-bye.